Hello, everybody. <laughs> I've been chatting a little bit for about the past 10 minutes with people. I am Michael Santos, um, and I'm here with our partner, some of our partners. I think Larry's on and Sam is on, and we are just super grateful for an opportunity to communicate with everybody that, that is in our community. I just sent out a separate email where I shared with you this page right here. And this page is going to guide is what I'm going to use to guide me through today's webinar. Um, so the link is is it's not really relevant because I'm going to be sending you a link out later today with a copy of the video and the audio file. If you guys have to check out or something like that, and you want to listen to this while you're driving or something, these are the topics that I'm going to cover. Um, but what's really important, I think, is um, is for 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 each of you to know this really works best as an interactive conversation. There is there is so many there are so many complexities in the Bureau of Prisons and going through it that many times law firms don't prepare their clients for or 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 they just people go in and they don't understand what's coming and it's really important for for me as the founder of the company to share to share this message with everybody. What I really don't want is ever a time somebody that goes into the system and say, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't, I wish somebody would have told me that. That's something I used to hear a lot while I was incarcerated is, is I would hear people say, I don't know anything. I didn't know this. I didn't know how to prepare for this. My lawyer didn't prepare me for this. And I don't want to, I don't ever want somebody to say that in our community. So it, it I, but I can't share everything I experienced while going through 26 years in prison in a snapshot in 30 minutes and 60 minutes, there's just too much stuff to cover. So we try to create these webinars in kind of a methodical way where we cover one subject over a period of about 10 or 12 weeks, focusing on a specific subject and, and inviting people to, to do their own homework and learn and read. And that's why we produce a lot of assets. But it's also really important for people in our webinars to understand there are different there are different um, things that we do, right? When you've come in, most of the people that have come into our webinar, it's because they they're coming in through our marketing channel, White Collar Advice, and they get to speak with Sam and Larry and Justin and and other people that work with us. Um, and, and, and hopefully they're working on their specific subjects to get ready for different stages of the journey, whether that journey is before they've ever been indicted, whether it's when they're dealing with a pre-sentence investigation report, whether it's they're dealing with getting ready for sentencing or dealing, getting ready to go into prison or on supervised release. There's always different mitigation strategies that people need to consider. And the more you listen and learn, the more confident you're going to become and saying, okay, I've got to architect this because there are things that I can do that my attorney may not do or may not know how to answer these questions. There's nothing anybody's going through that some member in our community hasn't gone through. And, there, and, and we want to help you sow seeds today so that you feel better going forward. But I, I just want to say on the bottom of these Zoom channels, there's a little button that says chat. And I want to find, make sure everybody knows where that chat button is. Um, so I think it's, I've got to find it myself. Oh, yeah, there's, it's right there. It just says chat. So if somebody has something to say, um, just because of the ground rule, just please plug in the, um, it into the chat. I can't monitor it and stay focused on the webinar, but some some members of our community may be able to monitor it and, and respond. But at the end of the webinar, I will go back to this chat and I will look at every question that hasn't been answered or I will ask again, hey, just unmute yourself and I will respond to those individual questions. I'm deeply committed to trying sharing um, as much as as much as anybody wants to learn with me, not only while you're in prison, not only while you're on these webinars, but also for those of you who are going into the criminal justice system, we want to help help you as well. And so we send information that we prepare that we send in through either the core links system or through these these um, uh, uh, mailings through the U.S. Postal Service. So we want to be with you all the way through your journey because we know that this journey has 
has many stages. And there's a, there's an article that we send, and I hope that you've all received it, that we've written about the mitigation arc, where we're talking about understand how you can start building a mitigation strategy depending upon where you are. And, and one thing I want to say about that is that that's never been more important than now because of the First Step Act and because of the evolution of the First Step Act. You've heard us talk about it before. If you haven't, if you're not familiar yet with the First Step Act, I would really encourage you to look through the resources on our website where we've spoken about it. We have one specific webinar that we cover the First Step Act um, because it's it's really important and 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 it's important that you understand it is evolving. When I say it is evolving, what I mean by that is what you see today is not going to be the same thing that's going to exist in the federal prison system, you know, I don't think in a year from now, because I know I'm going to be advocating for it. In fact, next week, I'm going to be in two federal prisons, one in Oxford, Wisconsin, and one in Rochester, Minnesota. And when I am there, I get to try to advocate for, for, for everybody in federal prison by talking about the importance of expanding the entire earned time credit policy. And that is, is part of this really big complexity of this system as I see it. It's the reason that our company, that we've organized our company the way that we have organized it, where you know, you've, we've got people like Sam and Larry and Justin and, and, and now Kent and Scott and, and so many other people that have gone through the journey and they're there to help you with their experiences and what they can do. But that's only one phase of it. The other phase of it is trying to expand these additional um, earn time credits so that everybody is eligible for them. Right now, there is, there is, there is, it's still evolving where the policy on first act credits, the Bureau of Prisons just published the policy like less than two weeks ago. And just yesterday, the Bureau of Prisons has started updating these new things called the computation sheet. But if you don't know what a computation sheet is, right, that's one of the areas where I say everybody has to learn about about these different aspects about serving time in prison. If you don't understand what a pattern score is, this is an area that you're not as strong as you could be about understanding what's available to you once you get into that system and what levers can you pull to make your life better. The more you know about that, the more it's going to make sense to you to start um, sowing seeds today for the outcome that you want in the weeks, months, years, and decades ahead. Because this does not end at the present your preparations for success does not end at the pre-sentence investigation report it doesn't end at sentencing it doesn't end when you're in prison it doesn't end when you're on supervised release when somebody comes into this system it's really important to realize this is like a 20 year time horizon we have people in our community that have been out of prison for 15 years and a bank calls them and says, oh, you have a felony, remove your money from my bank. And that starts introducing a whole series of problems. And, and, and that's why we feel it's so important to provide continuing education on how the system operates, share what's going on in different parts of the country, and hire um, subject matter experts that can help us advocate. And that's where my area is, is focusing on this bigger picture of change while our team focuses on micro areas of change and personal areas of change. And that's what our first webinar, so I'm kind of going back since I've been away from doing the webinars while I was traveling. I wanted to get everybody on this webinar today thinking about this, thinking about all the times that you have been successful in your life. Earlier on today's webinar, we were, I heard Kent and, and I forgot the other fellow's name that was talking with me about where they went to college. One went to Creighton, one went to Ohio University or Ohio State University. I don't know which one it was, um, but I have no doubt 
that everybody that's in our community spent time preparing before they went to college. You prepared by maybe hiring coaches to help you, SAT tutoring, whatever, or when you were building your career, you sowed a lot of seeds to get ready for the best possible experience. There's, this is, you're in that stage right now where you've got to start sowing these seeds today that will help you that just like you did then to get into the university that you wanted to get to or to get into the career that you wanted to get to or to accelerate your career so that you could be the best in the world at what you do all of that took preparation just like it takes preparation here and this has got to become I don't remember what that phrase is, but I think it, it's an unconscious conscious. Like you're, you're not even thinking about it. You know how every decision relates to something of what you're going to do in the future. And it would have been great for us to be able to communicate this message to people before anybody got caught or got anybody got, anybody got into the crosshairs of the criminal justice system. Unfortunately, that's very rare that we're communicating with people before they were ever a target. We always come in to the picture after somebody has hired a lawyer, after somebody has been sentenced, after been somebody has been gone through a series of, of areas that, that, that we can respond to, but we can't change. And we want you, we want everybody in our community to understand, I, I've, I've got to deal with the world as it exists, and I've got to understand the journey ahead, and I've got to understand something that's very important for me because I don't talk to you before you come into the system is that we are only here to help you advocate for yourself and show you the levers that you can pull along the way to make things better for yourself. And there's a lot of things that you can do. In my view, I always say you are more important than any defense attorney that's representing you. The judge knows what your defense attorney is going to say. The judge knows what the prosecutor is going to say. What the judge does not know is who you are and what, you, what, why you are worthy of mercy. And when I say the judge, I'm not only talking about the judge that's going to sentence you. I'm talking about all these stakeholders along the way. I'm talking about um, the probation officer who's judging you. I'm talking about the, um, the, the case manager in prison that is going to assess, are you a worthy candidate to get um, some kind of outcome that lets you serve your sentence on home confinement? I'm talking about a future credit creditor who might uh, partner with you or help you recalibrate your life and get back into business. I'm talking about the people who are going to um, partner with you in, in some area of your life right? This is the new reality. When somebody comes into the criminal justice system, there's a whole parade of collateral consequences that are going to follow. And the sooner I start understanding that, the sooner I can start saying, what, can, what seeds can I sow today that will help position me for a better outcome? What experts can I learn from today that will help me um, get out of there at the soonest possible time. Everybody's going to want to start with the lowest possible sentence, but you know we've had people in our community that thought they were their lawyer said they were going to get five years or seven years as well or seventy two months, and they end up getting a year and a day. I mean, Joe Dick Gregorio, that was a guy he's been on our earlier webinars that he's serving that sentence right now. He started off thinking he was going to get five years. I think Kent, Kent, tell him about your experience. You can unmute yourself. You got to unmute yourself. Yep. I'm happy to do it. So I jumped in and, and luckily I kind of, I still found you late, like you're referring to, but I found you early enough that I was able to start to prepare and plan. And, and honestly, it wasn't just preparing to get a better sentence, but kind of preparing for the, the life after prison just as much as well. Um, so went through all that stuff, was ready for the pre-sentencing interview, got the PSR back. And I think that that went very, very well. I was just sentenced the second week in November, um, and I'll kind of cut right to the chase with it, but the government was looking to get about 57 to 60 months and ended up getting sentenced to 15. And I haven't got my papers yet, but it looks like I'm going to be surrendering in January to Morgantown, West Virginia. So, so I'm really happy whenever I hear a story like that. There's no way we can predict what's going to happen, but I have no doubt, Kent, that you 
were way more influential in getting that 15 months than your lawyer was. And I want to hear your perspective on that. For sure. Uh, I mean, she did a great job getting like cases and data and kind of doing her, her part of the arguments, which were awesome. But we were certainly teammates. And I think that going into this, I was, uh, she even said multiple times how I was more well prepared than any client that she had ever had. I mean, going into the pre-sentencing interview, I had everything. I mean, I was ready to go. I understood kind of what I was getting into. Um, and then even at sentencing, um, we went over the sentencing memo together to make sure that we were all kind of uh, on the same page and kind of what we were going to talk about at sentencing, practicing my allocution. Um, it was a lot of work. I mean, the narrative, the letters, putting everything into it. Um, and that was just like I'm trying to tell you, that's a big part of it, kind of the proof to the plan and doing the action. And then the results of this is I think the 15 months was a big part. The judge did reference a lot of the things that I had done um, that I didn't just sit around all day that I was. I, I remember I was doing writing stuff about your volunteer work with us. And, and it was just like the, the last day. And, and you, did you did your judge refer to that? She did. She referenced it a lot, actually. So that was one of the things is I've I've been volunteering at a senior center now for about a year and a half. And it's a, a weekly two hour venture. I go over and I just I run games with uh, about 15 to 20 seniors every Thursday from 12 to two. And that relationship, I ended up getting a letter, a character letter from the director of that senior center. And that mixed in with, I lost my job when I took my plea, but I ended up finding another place of employment uh, before sentencing. So I'm working today. Um, I've got jobs lined up, hopefully when I get out. Um, it was, I mean, it was, it was kind of a whole story. I mean, it was from I didn't just sit around and, and kind of complain or cry and do a lot of the why is me. Don't get me wrong. I had those moments for sure, but was able to kind of get to the reality, like you said, of this is where we're living in. I can't change the past and I better start getting to work. And it okay. gave me motivation to have something to do every single day of a goal and a focus to get things done. And, and um, it's not done yet. I mean, like you've alluded to, so it's, I'm, I'm at this point in the journey and now it's preparing to surrender, what can I do in this next month and a half, two months before I go? Um, but so far, I'd, I'd say that I'm very happy with, as strange as that sounds, as happy as I can be for where I'm at. So, so thank you for sharing that. I, the, one of the things that we worked together on was a course that we created that I use. In, in fact, when you were asking me to write the letter, I was going into a federal prison in Greenville, Illinois, where I've taken courses that you created and brought them into prisons. That's when I talk about building a community, that's one of the things that I try to mention is that if it requires a lot of people for, for, for you to be able to say you've influenced and, and you are influencing more than a hundred thousand people go through our courses, your course is going in there. And I could write about that to your judge in that letter to your judge, because it's authentic. Your judge could see that you didn't just sit around, you were volunteering, you were building a record. Now, my experience is that very few law lawyers are telling their clients to be thinking about doing something different, right? If you, you spoke about allocution, people will sp speak about I'm going to miss my kids. I, you know, I, I miss my wife. I shouldn't be going to prison. I'm sorry. But that's not really what moves the needle. What really moves the needle is what you have done. And so I'm, I'm going to say this specifically to one of our um, uh, uh, members of our community right now, whose husband is serving uh, time inside of a detention center and he's volunteering in the prison. It's really important to communicate, like document it. Right. I would if, if I were in that situation and I just heard what Kent said, I would be saying, OK, here's a calendar that I'm creating and I'm in this detention center and I'm locked it down. But every day I'm trying to contribute to my community and I'm teaching this many people and this guy's going to get his GED. Document that information and figure out, OK, I can weave that into my story when I go to sentencing. The more you can differentiate yourself from everybody else that gets before the, the judge. That's what Kent did. He differentiated himself and he was able to get a 15 month sentence instead of a 60 month sentence, which is what the prosecutor recommended. 
The other important takeaway is that Kent said, it's not over. And so you've got to be thinking also, yes, you want to advocate for yourself to get the lowest possible sentence. But even when you get the lowest possible sentence, you've got to keep this effort going. And you've got to learn about what's going on around the country that I can, what, what levers can I pull to navigate my way to get home, to home confinement at the soonest possible time. And that's why this concept of earned time credits and the First Step Act are so important. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of people on our, in our community that can help you understand the journey, but the more you understand before surrendering and the more you understand about being inside, the better off you're going to be. And now if I turn to the second slide on our journey, this is, a, this is something new that I haven't spoken about before on our previous webinars. But I also want you to think about your career and your recalibration of what you're going to do when you come home. Um, and the reason I think that is so important is because people, understandably, when you go in there, the only thing I'm thinking about, for, first of all, it, it, a lot of times it's deer in the headlights. How did I get here? I don't even understand how I, 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 anybody's looking at me as being a criminal. I, I've always considered myself to be a good citizen and a, and a business person or something along those lines. You know, I never thought of myself in this way. But that's, that's not going to help you. I need you to think 10 years down the road, five years down the road, 15 years down the road, and what does your life look like? The sooner you start thinking about that, the, 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 the more you're going, the stronger you're going to be in, in restoring self-confidence that I'm not going to be wasting my time in here. I can't, I, I spoke, I speak with people all the time that used to have professional careers that cannot believe how difficult it is for them to get back on the horse and start rebuilding their life. We had one fellow that we wanted to hire. He was, used to be an anesthesiologist and he was uh, got himself in trouble in the in the Bureau of Prisons and went to prison. And he got out and he was in a halfway house. But the only way he could transition from the halfway house to home confinement was he had to have a job. And this is a guy that's really succeeded in every area of his life, you know, as you can imagine, to become an anesthesiologist. He's become really success. He was really successful as a student, really successful as a businessman, but. Something happened in the course of his career that led to him coming into prison. Now he's in the halfway house and he wants to get out, but he can't because he finds he can't get a job. When your name is attached to a criminal indictment and somebody's Googling you, it's going to show up. And, and sometimes that hurts. What's important to think about of why is it so hard when you've been an accomplished professional to get back into the job market? Why is it so hard? Part of the reason is because, you know, it, it costs a lot of training to hire somebody. And when you're going to put somebody into a role, you know, it would think like, yeah, I want to hire the smartest guy in the room. But if I know I'm hiring the smartest guy in the room, I know that that guy's not going to be committed to my job to just get, get a career. That's what this anesthesiologist found. And he, and he passed like six weeks or so, never getting past the initial interview. And eventually his halfway house guy said, well, the only place I could send you to is a 7-Eleven that I could get you the job as a clerk. By that time, the guy said, I'll take it. I just want to get out of the halfway house. And he goes and takes this job as a clerk at the 7-Eleven. It was directly across the street from the hospital where it used to be, it wasn't an anesthesiologist, he was an emergency room doctor. It was exactly across the street from the hospital where he was. And, and the humiliation he felt of having his former colleagues come in there to buy a pack of gum or something. And he's now doing the clerk work at the, at the 7-Eleven. I want you to be thinking about all of these things today because too many people go into the system and the only thing we're thinking about is to get the lowest sentence. But getting the lowest sentence is definitely important, but there are a lot of a lot more complications that we've got to solve for. And if you don't have that plan laid out, how am I going to rebuild? How am I going to recalibrate? Let's start working with our team 
and our community and asking questions, what did other people do? How did they do this? Because that should that's something that I think the sooner you start architecting that story, the better off you are in documenting and memorializing your journey. And one of the most successful guys I know that memorializes his journey, I'm super proud that he's joining our team and he's with us right now. And that's Scott, who um, maybe you could tell them about your what you did, Scott. And you probably guys have talked about it before, but I keep wanting to get their input because I want to remind everybody here who's at this earlier stage to begin thinking, what can I do? Scott, why don't you tell them what you did? <clears throat> sure. So I started a website. It, it was a blog just to document the journey and sort of change the narrative around what had happened to me and, and what I wanted to do moving forward. So I would write weekly posts about what I was experiencing in prison, what I was learning. I would also write book reports at least once a week about what books I'm reading, the lessons I'm taking away from them, and how that is going to help me once once I'm released. Uh, you know, I, I relate to where everyone is at because it's I was in this interesting position where I was reeling in pain from what happened, but also aware that I needed to start preparing for the future. And just taking action every day really helped. And it's been been very enjoyable to see the fruits of that labor um, going well lately. It's it's changed the narrative surrounding what happened and was a really enjoyable project to undertake. It's it's also a really helpful tool for anybody who doesn't know about how Scott did it to reach out to him. He is super, uh, he's super resourceful and super generous with his time as far as, hey, let me show you how I did it because we don't give like any magic pills, right? This is, there's nothing that I am sharing with you that is not freely available on our website or freely available by talking to somebody. Everything that we, that we sell through white collar advice is we show it on, on prison professors for free that anybody can seize and learn. How do I do this? If we could be a resource for you and helping you execute on that, then that's, those are jobs that Sam and Justin and Scott and, and maybe Kent can help you understand. But it's all about, just as it was for you to become successful in your career, it's about how hard are you willing to work to sow seeds for the best possible outcome? And how do I become part of a machine that keeps it going? Because there are some things that we can help you do uh, because of the because we built this ecosystem, and that's one of the areas that I really encourage everybody to study and learn. I I have this section on our site that I really want people to learn about. Um, is it this one? Oh, it's over here. Okay, so I've got the wrong. I got multiple windows on my screen, but I think you can see it right now. If I go here to the top of our website, and you see this section right here called subject matter experts. If you haven't sat back and listened to this interview, which is the former chief of U.S. federal probation, who is talking about how he would look at people's records and what they did throughout the journey, through the early stage all the way through, and how that would influence his decision on granting higher levels of liberty to people. The sooner you learn and the more you learn about that, the better off you're going to be. Or listen to the former director of the Bureau of Prisons. And through the conversations, there's two of these interviews. I work closely with him. And I'm always working in a capacity to create more, more opportunities. Like I, I told you earlier, I was in federal prisons last week. I'm going to be in two federal prisons this week. And through doing that, through that effort, I get to try and influence wardens, I help members of our community get a better outcome. I, I, I can't guarantee what's going to happen, but I have a seat at the table with people who are truly stakeholders in your life. Federal judges, if you haven't watched our interviews with federal judges and you've already been sent, you have not yet been sentenced, then it really behooves you to spend the time to learn how, what these judges are saying you can do to get the kind of outcome that Kent had where somebody might be saying something about your life, but what, what are you getting? Um, sorry about that. I'm going to just stop this here. Um, what are you getting? Um, 
what are you doing to influence these people much that you're going to meet later? This is the former head of the entire home confinement halfway house system. He's a member of our team. He's one of our subject matter experts that we use him to advocate for people when they have different challenges. That's the value of being a member of our community. But I always tell people, you can do this yourself. Everybody can, okay? I did it. I didn't have a community and I went through 26 years in prison. There are things that I wish I would have known early in the journey that would have helped me not get 26 years in prison. There are things that I wish I would have known to have adv advocated for myself along the way that I didn't learn until I was you know, in the ocean swimming and having to figure it out. But if you're on this webinar, you're not yet in the system. So you can begin sowing these seeds. It's just work. You've got to read. You've got to come here and be prepared with your questions. If I'm saying anything to any of you that you don't understand, please raise your hand. There's a little button down here, three three where is it down there it's reactions on the bottom of your screen and you could raise your hand and i could see oh you want to ask me a question we should have those kinds of interactions regardless of where you are or reach out to scott and reach out to sam and reach out to justin and reach out to other members of our community offline so that you could find so that you could find out where do i get the information that i need to help me along this journey, because this is a journey that doesn't end. In fact, one of the guys that just joined us, his, um, I don't know if he can talk right now because I don't know his stage of the criminal justice proceedings, but he was an expert sales guy, he used to be the top, top, top of the, uh, you know, top of the food chain in his industry in a billion dollar company. And some challenges came and he went into prison and he's having to deal with that and recalibrate his life from, you know, earning a million plus a year to saying, holy crap, I'm now a felon. I got to build something, but he's recalibrating and he's building and, and he's created a program that he's going to be selling to other people. And, you know, Alec, I, I don't know if you're able to talk, but if you are, you wanted to, you wanted to be, um, you wanted to have some one-on-one -on -one time with me. I want you to know there's 40, 50 people here that could learn what seeds you started to sow early on in the journey and how you are using that now as you're on the other side of rebuilding your life. If you're able to talk, unmute yourself and talk. If you're not, tell them what you're doing and how your early pre preparations put you in a position to do this. Are you able to talk and can yeah, you share that? You. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. We all hear you right now. Okay. Yeah. So, hey, look, I'm smiling. I'm smiling for the first time in God knows how many years. I mean, you know, at the beginning, um, you know, when I was under indictment and on pretrial, uh, you know, there were dark times. I was just consumed and um, almost paralyzed for a while. Uh, you know, the old, my, my saving grace really was finding you and Justin. Uh, it, it, it helped me understand that there Let me just say, before you say that, I one thing I want to say, first of all, I appreciate that, but I want to make very clear, this is in no way some type of sales garbage. I, I'm not, I, I will never, I, everything I do is for, you can get for free. Okay. I don't, I don't, I know that you're going to say, and I appreciate and respect you for saying just, reaching out just to me, but that almost sounds to me like I'm asking you, Hey, sell, sell us. This is not about that. This is about no, no. you, right? No, I'm telling the people, I know I'm not saying to you out, I'm telling everybody here, I never want our team to come across as we're always selling you, right? As I said before, everything I give, it's free on our website. You could learn how to do it, but somebody's got to do the work. And so if you're hiring us, I hope our team is doing the work to help you. Alec, you're successful because you did the work. All we did is show you how to do it and continue on with your story. Yeah, well, I mean, doing the work, again, prior to going to prison is, at least for me, it's not an easy task because again, my mind was not as sharp as it once was uh, before I got into trouble. I mean, there were days where, you know, I couldn't think, um, but so I did, I did the work, Mike, yes but I needed someone to kind of guide me 
and give me some sort of roadmap because it was too much, quite frankly, for me initially uh, to conceptualize and actually dive into. But yeah, um, I did a lot of work. Uh, I wrote a book, right? Um, you know, I didn't complete it until I got out of prison, but it was 90% done before I went in. And, um, you know, while I was in, I continued to write, I continued to study, I can continued to think, you know, for me, and I don't know, you know, I'm just speaking ad lib, but for me going to prison, the best way that I could uh, explain it is for me, it was like when you're a child and you get in trouble, your parents put you in timeout. For prison, prison for me was one long, miserable timeout. Because the concept of timeout is to get you to think about, well, it's just to get you to think. I'm not asking you to think about what you did right, what you did wrong. It just gets you to think. And believe me, you think. You, you got unlimited amount of time to think and reflect. And then you then once you get past that, you start to figure out, oh wow, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get through this and I'm gonna get out of prison. And I better have a plan. So I better start thinking about my plan for when I get out. Um, I had the, I, I had a plan, you know, I wrote the book. Um, I knew that I wanted to, I knew that I love to speak to people. I knew that I love to coach. Uh, yeah, given, like given it, give them some context of the, the role that you had in your career. I don't know. I don't want to ask you to put you on the spot because I don't know what you can reveal, but how, what was the size of your, I know you're in sales. What size of sales company did you organize and how much, what were your revenues? Yeah, I mean, we started off. I mean, the the owner of the company uh, invested like fifty nine million. He was in the red um, when I was brought in. Uh, within the first year, we did a hundred million. We ended up doing over three billion in sales. Um, in so you years. you built a company, went to three billion in sales, and then you got, went to prison. And you, when you started, what was your exposure? How much time were you facing? Oh, well, you know, some crazy number, 10 years, maybe and, more. And what did you serve? Uh, I got a 26 month sentence. I did 10 months inside, nine and a halfway house and three on house arrest. Okay. And then you came home and now you're a guy that used to lead a multi-billion dollar sales team, VP of sales. It's a very public story, but I don't want to bring it out because I don't know if you can talk about it, but then say something else. What was the job that you had when you got out? Oh, I was, uh, I worked in a cubicle. I, I did phone sales. I basically telemarketing. Okay. Tele movie, telemarketing movie. sales. But while he was doing that, he was also building a new venture, which you're starting right now. And what kind of business is that? It's a, it's a sales training, sales coaching, um, mentoring, uh, speaking. I created an online digital course. Uh, for those who take the course and want more, I sell consulting services um, and, you know, my whole life, basically what I do is I find a couple of people that need me and I dedicate myself 24 seven. So if someone brings me on as a consultant, I'm literally available 24 seven. So, so the, the reason I wanted everybody in our community, cause this is like the first webinar. I want you to think like Alec, like Kent, like Scott, it's super simple to just focus on the sentence on, oh my God, why did I get indicted? Oh, what, how am I going to get through this? And that can be paralyzing. Okay. Every, you know why? Because you're just, you're a marionette puppet, right? You're, you're, somebody's pulling all the strings of your life. Your lawyer's pulling the strings. Um, you're, you don't know what the prosecutor's going to say. You don't know what the judge is going to do. You can't get out of bed. But the second you start working, the second you start doing what Kent said he did or Scott said he did or Alex, said, everything changes. Now, all of a sudden, you are looking at saying, what can I do to launch the next chapter of my life? And the sooner you start doing that, the sooner you are going to, the more powerful you are going to be in getting back to that stage where you are, um, you're, 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 you're planting seeds to influence that journey along the way. And so that's what, that's what I wanted you to be thinking about today. It's not only the sentence, because as Alex said, you're going to get through it. As Scott experienced, you're going to find a way to get through it. The more you learn, the more you educate yourself, the better off you're going to be. 
and we certainly have a lot of resources to help you see, but you know, I can't do it for you. This is all about self-advocacy. How do I get myself, my confidence back? How do I work toward getting the lowest possible sentence? And how do I understand how every single decision I make is going to influence that journey going forward? Because you're going into a different world. You're going into a world where you're going to be surrendering. There's going to be different conversations. You're going to have different experiences. Everybody is going to be judging you, including the staff and including the other people in prison. And the more you know about how that those complexities work and all the different moving parts, because they all have an influence on how you get out. Earlier, we were talking about somebody whose husband is working on cooperating, okay? And that seems like the right thing to do and to understand, to cooperate, to get the best outcome, to get back into being in society, to cooperate. But remember where you are going, because once you get into that system, you have to understand how will the other people respond if you are cooperating? And if you don't have a story around that, how do I evolve and, and prepare myself for those, those complications? Because new complications can, can come from that, okay? If you're going to ask me what's the best thing to do, I'm going to tell you I can't answer that question for you unless you define success in your life. If success for you is to get out of prison at the soonest possible time and to advance your life again as a law-abiding contributing citizen, then cooperating is the most is the, is the is the easiest way to get there. And that is has nothing to do with your defense attorney. That has to do with you, but there are going to be complications that come with that. And so you need to understand, okay, how do I understand those complications? How are the other people in the prison going to react to that? What can I do to minimize my exposure to problems and maximize my exposure to opportunities? Again, all of that information completely available on our website. Um, read through it. If you read the different books, if you if you don't want to read, then listen. It's one of the reasons that we have a podcast so that while you're driving down the road, you can be learning about people that had good experiences and how did they deal with them? How did they prepare for them? One thing I need to prepare you for is prison is prison, okay? Staff members, when you're thinking about staff, I want you to, to think about any other person that starts a job. Who grows up and says, I want to build my career with the Bureau of Prisons? What does that person want? Okay, that person wants to get a paycheck. They want to retire early. They want to have a government secure job. Okay, if you think that because their title is correctional officer, that they're going to correct and make things better for you, that's that's on you for not doing the work in advance and learning about the system, and it's going to position you for a lot of disappointment. If you think there's going to be a counselor in the Bureau of Prisons that are genuinely interested in counseling you on getting through the biggest crisis in your life, is that your fault when you get there and the counselor doesn't do that? Is it the counselor's fault? In my view, everything is my fault. Everything right? It was my fault that I sold cocaine when I was 20 years old. It was my fault that I chose to completely outsource all my decisions to my defense attorney, which is why I went to trial and I took the stand and I got a 45-year sentence. It's my fault, not my attorney's fault. My attorney, he had his own objective in mind, right? Get as much money from me as he could and then get on to the next client. I don't ever want anybody in our community to say that's what we did. We are here to help you understand the journey ahead and get off of supervised release at the soonest possible time and have an outcome like Alec where you're not waiting for somebody else to hire you or deal with complications like that emergency room doctor I spoke about, but to get your confidence back and to get back to your family at the soonest possible time and live a life of meaning and relevance and dignity. And all of that starts 
with this concept of saying, I'm going to be very comfortable with getting uncomfortable. I am going to understand the conversations and the, and the questions that people are going to ask me. I'm going to understand that staff are there because they have their own job to do and they have their own family and they want to get through this and get home after their eight hour shift. They are not there to solve your problems. And, and, and you don't need to take my word for that. Just look at recidivism rates and see that, you know, seven out of 10 people that go into the system have ongoing problems when they get out. Even when they're done with the sentence, they're having problems getting to home confinement early or getting a job or getting back their career back in order, right? All of those are problems that we want to help you solve. And it's why we publish these resources on our website. I encourage you to please use the website as a tool. I know it's a tremendous amount of information. I know that it takes a lot and you want somebody to be able to solve your problems, but your lawyer cannot solve those problems and nobody on our team can solve those problems. All we can do is deal with the world as it exists and say, hey, these are things that we did. These are things that we learn from hiring subject matter experts. These are things that I learned by going into prisons. I want everybody in our community to, be a, to always be a member of our community to help more people get the best outcome, regardless of where they are today. I want people to understand you have to be the architect of your life of this, not your attorney and, and not us to some extent. We're going to be there as a resource helping you while you're inside. We're going to show you, hey, you've got to invest right now spending some time on this website, right? Go to this website right here, BOP.gov, and understand this website. How does this work? Because this is going to be a very important part of your life, this website. You want to be able to go to locations and say, okay, I think I'm going to go. You may not know where you're going, but if you know, I, I heard somebody earlier today speak about, oh, I think I'm going to go to, um, I don't know, forget which, it doesn't matter. Go to Milan. I want to go to the Milan website. I want to say, okay, what does this prison look like? I want to understand, do we know anybody in our community who's there at Milan? But more importantly, scroll down here <clears throat> and learn by just reading this book, okay? The, the Admissions and Orientation Handbook, because you are going to be responsible for understanding this book when you get there. But look at how complicated it is. There's 38 pages of, of boilerplate bureaucratic stuff that you're going to say, I don't understand what this thing means here. This is where you should be going to get to get um, to ask me better questions, okay? Ask us questions. If there's anything on here that you're reading and you don't understand every single thing about it, why would they have it here? Why would they have information here about what is sexually abusive behavior? What does that mean? Why, why do I have to worry about that when I'm going into prison? Well, there are reasons that you need to know about this. And if you have questions, make sure you ask members of our community. It doesn't matter which prison you look, you review, all of these prisons have their information handbook, okay? If you don't know how to architect your way to get to the right prison, please ask early because there are things that we can do to help you get to the prison you want to get to if you ask early. If you ask late, then we can only kind of fix what went wrong. And our level of our prospects for success on that area are significantly lower than if you ask us early. And so like on this preliminary webinar that I wanted to offer, I wanted to provide all of this information to hopefully guide you as you're going forward and give you homework. Homework that you should be doing as you, as you position yourself to navigate your way through the most difficult journey of your life. And this is crisis management. Crisis management is about saying, nobody else is going to be able to solve this problem but you, but you need 
guidance, like Alex said, what, what should I be doing now? How is this going to help me later? Because I, I can't, nobody can, can undo the past. All of us can sow seeds for a better future. And we want to show you pathways to do that. Now, again, I've been speaking for a lot. We're already at an hour. I don't care to be here all day with you. I am deeply committed to giving you everything that we can. And I hope every member of our community is as well. But I definitely want to be positioning you so that these don't become monologue webinars. But there are a lot of hands going up and questions going up. I see on the chat, there's, there's quite a bit. And I'm going to get to this chat as soon as I, I zip through a little bit more of these of the of this prepared section of our of our webinar but my goal is that you are 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 doing your own research by understanding how does the bureau of prisons work if i've got a medical complication have you looked through the bop formulary do you understand what parts one and part two are if you've got any type of medical challenges in your life? You could ask us later while you're in prison, and we will certainly be there if the Bureau of Prisons does what the Bureau of Prisons is very well known for doing, which is making things hard for people in prison. But if we resolve these problems early, before you've been gone through a pre-sentence investigation report, hopefully, we can help you much better. If you don't understand how the phone system works, the mail system works, how to send money in prison, how much it costs to live in prison, how your um, perhaps financial restitution is going to influence your life in prison. These are real complications. So let's learn about them early and come to these webinars asking questions. If you don't know What's going to happen on your first day in prison? Well, we want to help you understand that. That's what next week's webinar is going to be about, really, is that, hey, let's, let's get an idea of what, what happens these first days, these first weeks and inside, and what can I do today before I get there that will make that a little bit easier on my family, my community, myself, okay? How, what are these... What are these things that I should be doing right now in anticipation of that potential day when I go into prison? So, so like that's the main thing I wanted to cover in the prepared remarks is make sure that you come with your questions because I want to be able to provide you with the response that I would give to anybody based, and it's based on having gone through 26 years in prisons of every security level and having worked with thousands of people that have gone through the journey and what they can do and giving you the benefit of my knowledge of all the other work that I do on advocacy side of working with the Bureau of Prisons and going into prisons and institutions and, and also making sure that you understand what our team does. I don't want any I don't want anybody to go in there with some misleading concept that we've promised something because a lot of people they get promised stuff from their defense attorneys and then it doesn't work out. The only thing I can promise you is I will always be honest and 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 help you understand how I would deal with these complications if I were in that situation and how I did it and how I overcame the complications because I had a tremendous amount of them. But it's not about me. I've already done it. I've already gone through 9,500 days of imprisonment. I've already dealt with all those complications of financial ruin and divorce and finding love in prison and building a new career in prison. And, and, and my whole life is about trying to change this outcome for everybody's in there. And I'm grateful to every member of our team who's doing it as well. But I want you to understand how do you help yourself? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn to the questions right now because it's almost 930. But I just wanted to show one other thing before I turn to the, to the comments and the questions and so on and so forth. And you should be able to see this section of our website anywhere. If you go to the home section of the prison professors, just so you know, you know, this is like the home section and you could, you know, you're going to get all kinds of free stuff that you could learn about. Um, but if you click on any of these 
sections like like here say you know go to the blog i think it's the blog and if i go to one of the blogs um and i go to this like today's section you'll see that there's this sidebar i want you guys to be able to scroll down through this sidebar and there's a couple of areas that i'm going to be revising over this weekend because of that new policy statement you'll see these four boxes here one of those lessons with subject matter experts that's where you can go to watch those different videos one of them is our webinar series. This is where we do the recordings of all the previous and the future webinars. But these two are really important. One of them is going to be the pattern score calculator. And I just opened it there in a separate tab. And one is the, the release date calculator. I have to do some rework on these two pages, which I'll be doing over the weekend. But I hope that you have spent, taken some time to understand how does this work? Because this is really important for you. Um, and you could just, there's two, there's one for men and there's one for women. And if you click on this, you know, you're going to see how do I score myself and you could just scroll down and all you got to do is answer the questions and you're going to come up with the score. This is directly, we pulled it right from the BOP's website and we built this calculator so you can get a, an, a projection of how the BOP is going to score you. And then once you have that, you could then use this projected release date where all you would have to do is like, let's just say I was going to do it. I'm going to plug in my name and my email. And hypothetically, you know your sentence release date. Okay, so my original sentence, like, let's just put 48 months. I could say I started this sentence in, you know, 0220-2021. And I have, I, I have a day of jail credit. Everybody's going to have at least one day of jail credit. And then this is the area where it's important to know your, your, your pattern scores. But let's just say I've got one there and, and, and 15 there, whatever. It's going to give me, then if I submit that document, um, oh, I, I didn't do, if I did RDAP, plug that, it's going to give me this information here. Um, then it's going to take me to this thank you page. And in the mail, then I don't think I can show you, but in the mail, I will get my answers back. I want you to know that this is going to change from today until Monday because the Bureau of Prisons has changed, okay? The Bureau of Prisons has now put out a release date. It's my whole, uh, uh, um, or rather a policy statement that's talking about how they are doing earned time credits. I know that my friend Scott is on supervised release right now. It's my hope he's going to get a notification that says he, he's, they're going to advance his release date because of a new policy. And we should be seeing that in the next few days because they, they were supposed to recalibrate everybody on December the 1st. Those were my prepared remarks for today's first webinar. What I'd like to do now, um, I can either go through these comments that are on there, or I see that people have answered, have started raising their hand, which is great. And Jason, I want to thank you for being the first person that has raised your hand. So if you have any questions at all, I want to respond to those questions. And I just give you my word, I'll be here as long as you guys want to stay on. We did the first hour of prepared remarks. Let me now turn to the questions. Jason, let's do the people that want to do it interactively first, and then I'll go through this meeting chat if nobody's answered yet. But Jason, unmute yourself and and thank you for being with us. I know I've spoken to you before. What's going on? So, um, hi guys. Um, if you'll allow me to do this unsolicited, unsolicited so that everybody will know. Um, Michael, I just finished your book and uh, I know everything about you and Carol and you now. It's unbelievable journey. She's sitting right across the hall oh, from me there. <laughs> man, tell her, yeah. She he's is a, the woman. She is me, the woman. Let me tell you guys a story about that. So he's referring to you. I'm going to let you continue, but I got to tell you a funny story about that. So if you look at the first page of our website on that, you'll see, you'll see an African-American guy. His name is Halim Flowers. And he's the guy that was serving a double life sentence in prison. And he went through our course in prison because that's what I do. I create these courses and bring them into jails and prisons. And if you haven't watched the interview with Halim, you got to watch it because there's this funny story in there where he went through the course, he got out of prison early and he's home now and he's this really successful artist. It's just an amazing su success story of a guy who recalibrated his life. 
But when he's told me, he said, you know, I want you to know something. I went through your course, Jason. He said, you're not the real hero of your story. It's your wife, Carol. She's the real hero. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the absolute truth. She, so I was so fortunate to get married in prison. Um, but Jason, thank you so much. Continue what you were going to share with our community. Uh, uh, no, no doubt. So if you, if you guys haven't read Michael's book, you know, Earning Freedom, then I do what I did. I listened to it in the car every day every uh, either in the car or either you know on my on my phone and i was talking with uh justin and i, and I started reading justin's book lesson you know lesson from from prison and then i sent him a message i need this on audio and uh, uh, uh hopefully uh hopefully he has that but what i wanted to share with our community today is that uh uh you know so i, I met um i met you guys about eight months too late because uh when i but it wasn't too late. It was just, I, I could have done a lot better for myself if I'd known that uh, you all existed b b before my uh, PSR. But what has happened, I've had three wins since uh, I've been involved with the uh, White Collar Consultants. And that is, number one, um, I've been a uh, three-time cancer survivor. Um, so, you know, my body's kind of ravaged with it and I got special leg conditions and all kinds of stuff that's going on. But I drew the meanest judge in the system, period. He, he, he didn't care. So long and short of it is that the uh, thing number one is that I was going to, um, to Butner, North Carolina, uh, F, uh, to, the, to the prison hospital, uh, FMC. And I just happened to be looking online and White Collar Consultant pops up and I click on it. Next thing you know, I'm on the phone with Sam the next day who is my uh, personal savior right now. So uh, I was telling, you know, Sam asked me a couple of questions I couldn't answer. I mean, I, I didn't know what my F and C was. I didn't know how it was designated. I was just dumbfounded. So that's how I, you know, ended up here. And so, you know, thing number one was that uh, uh, Sam and Larry got me, the first order of business was to get out of the FMC because now my cancer numbers are at zero. And I felt I was going to be chained to a, a bed uh, for the first 18 months. But my lawyer didn't want to do it, didn't want to do it. But Sam and Larry taught me how to fight my own lawyer back, you know, to get stuff done. It's unbelievable. We, you pay them six figures and you give your whole life to them. And, they, and they're not even on your side uh, to start with. But so I got moved. So I got moved from um, the actual um, the hospital to the camp. Well, uh, with that, Michael, you know, I'm in a program, if you don't mind me sharing, you know, with you, with, with the no, community. No, this is, this is for us to, I want everybody to learn. They can, learning from you, would, you would have been very helpful for you to hear that story at the start of your journey. There are people at all different stages here. So I, I, I really want people to learn that there are things you can do that your lawyer can't do. But if you don't do the work, I don't know how you found our team, Jason, because that's not my area. My area is trying to, you know, there are so many complications on this system that this is going to evolve my, evolve my career for the rest of my life. And I take a story like yours, Jason, and take it to a regional director of the Bureau of Prisons, and I can get them to think more about when somebody's designated to the wrong person prison get them to go to the right prison and that's just advocacy but lawyers don't always do that i'm not here to criticize lawyers or the bop i'm here to say we all have to be our own best advocates and that's what you were and congratulations on that well so um i'll i'll i won't make i won't make it too long but i want somebody else in this community may have a medical issue or something that has changed. So long and short of it, um, uh, Sam and Larry and um, some information from Scott also, they helped me, uh, you know, navigate this piece with my attorney so that I got out of the hospital into the FMC, um, to, you know, at that point. But what Sam and those guys didn't know is that I had, you know, entered into a um, drug and rehabilitation program with my provider, who is Kaiser Permanente. And once I, you know, I shared that piece of it, Butner, North Carolina is seven and a half hours from my house versus um, Montgomery uh, is only two and a half hours. So we went back to my attorney and said, look, you know, we're going to, 
we're going to try the impossible now. We're going to we're going to open up this PSR. And he's like, oh, no, that could never happen. It could never be a minute. It could not, it, that's just impossible for that to happen. Once again, I go back to the well. Larry writes the order for me. We go over it. Sam, you know, Sam teaches me what to do. I go back to my attorney and he was hell bent that none of this could happen. None of this could happen. Well, guess what? We open it up. Well, the judge, you know, says, okay, here's a letter from Kaiser Permanente. Here's the order from Larry and my piece from Sam. And they actually amend my PSR to add what has happened with me, what's going on with me with regards to my, my, um, um, uh, alcohol and drug program. So now my PSR is amended. The impossible happens. So now I'll get a chance to get into RDAP. Third thing, and I'll get off the get off your your call here. That's is okay. That my uh, I have a condition called lymphedema. That's after my second cancer surgery of lymph node, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. My legs swell. My lymph nodes don't know what to do. So I've had to have rehab, you know, for six months. So it started acting up on me again. I was supposed to go in December 15th. I go back to Larry and Sam again. <laughs> and I say, you know, I need a little bit more time because they're going to let me go back to rehab for another 30 days. So I could actually, you know, probably turn in myself in January. And my attorney says, there's no way, there's no way this guy is going to do anything else for you. And I said, well, we'll see. So Larry writes the order for me. Sam tells me what to do. I shove it down my uh, uh, attorney's uh, <laughs> desk because now I know another term. If you don't do it, I'm going to go pro se. Exactly. So it could be me or you, but this guy is going to see what I need. Just yesterday, I get it back, you know, and so I get a, uh, um, a, uh, a new date to go in of January uh, January 10th instead of December 15th. So I just I just said all that to say to you guys, um, self-advocacy is everything, everything. And, um, you know, I get a chance to uh, try to go into the system as physically prepared as I can be. And between now and then, of course, I'll be getting my story, get my, my, my re, re, um, you know, release things together along with a nonprofit that I got that idea from Joe nonprofit that I'm working with that um, are helping kids uh, learn how to play chess and stay out of trouble and all these particular things that I can do before I go in. So thanks so, guys. Jason, thank you. And I'm glad that you get to spend the holidays with your family as well as get the treatment that you need and get the outcome that you want. But the, he's giving us really good information about self-advocacy. All of you likely have a defense attorney or had a defense attorney, but nobody's going to be more important than you. So I want you, if you, if we learn, participate in our webinars, if you can't, if you don't have the time to be here on a Friday or a Saturday morning, then, then just click the iTunes channel and you may hear some of the same stuff over again, but it's because it's so important and there's always people coming in. But I really want you to know, regardless of where you are, there are more complications are coming. More complications are coming. You know, it's never too early and it's never too late to be a member of this community, but there, there's going to be complications when you're in prison. Our team, that's what we're here for, help you overcome those. So when that happens in there, you'll reach out and, and, and <clears throat> we're, we're really fortunate to have guys like Sam, who we just said, who's, who is responsive, but Sam is one member. We've got Larry, we've got Carol, my wife, we've got Justin, we've got um, Clayton that are looking at these emails that are coming in, Scott, and, and we're going to be responsive and we're going to, we, we want to give you the tools to help you when you face those same kinds of obstacles and negative negativity. The lawyer, of course, he's going to say he wants to be done, right? He's, he feel he wants to be done. He felt like he got your money. He got the sale. You got, I can't do anything more for you. Every time we're giving him more work, it's some, but you can learn how you can do it yourself. And that's what we want to share with you. So now, unless somebody raises a hand, I'm going to go through the chat. I don't know if people have responded before, but I'm going to read, just going to read through them and I'm going to respond. Please feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand if you want to interact just as Jason did. So the first one here is I was in Morgantown 
with Mr. Sosta, who I believe you know. Yes, we know Mr. Sosta. And we have heard that the BOP is supposed to be do an update on the FSA by today. It was actually supposed to start yesterday, December the 1st. But remember, there's 120,000 people in federal prison. It should be automated, but I would be giving it a week to 10 days, just experience with the Bureau of Prison to see all these things resolved. Um, but it was supposed to start yesterday, according to our subject matter experts. It says here, FSA has been evolving since 2018. Yes, the BOP has done everything in its power to disallow the credits, in my opinion. Well, I appreciate that is your opinion, but as somebody who's gone through that system, I want to just give you a different perspective. And, 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 and people can dismiss my perspective. That's okay. But I definitely want to leave it with you because I've been in prison through all kinds of prison reform movements. From, since 19, I started my sentence in 1987. So, and I was in for 26 years. So I saw a lot of changes in the Bureau. There's never... The last time the Bureau has had reform as big as this one was in 1987 when they changed it from the new law to the old law, which brought in the sentencing guidelines and did away with parole. So this is a major, major lift. Yes, President Trump signed it in 2018, but because it was such a big lift, Congress gave the Bureau a year to just create those pattern scores. And a lot of people don't understand them. And then... They created him, and then they were supposed to have more time to train 40,000 people that work in the Bureau. But it's a whole different Bureau. It's one of the reasons that I keep telling you it's so important for you now to be understanding why to be your best advocate, because the, the new policy is designed to help people who help themselves. That wasn't the case when I served my sentence. And there's going to be continuing advocacy going forward, but... It's, it's not up to the Bureau to change your life. It's up to yours. And, and it's up to you. And I want to help you do that. I want you to help you say, I, I don't care what the Bureau of Prisons does. I can't change the machine. I can always change myself. I can say, okay, whatever the machine's doing, I can't change what Congress said. I can change myself. And what everybody that's going into the system now has is an ability to advocate for yourself in a way that wasn't even possible five years ago, where you could ask the judge to reconsider your sentence. So I just want to throw that out there for people because you've got to be prepared for disappointment. There's going to be disappointment. We're going to help you learn how to advocate for yourself when those disappointments come. We're going to give you an ability to understand how to do administrative remedies and habeas petitions and letters to pro se to the court that you can do. But this is the time to be learning about that. And, and yes, it's very difficult in there a lot of times because they don't do, if the agency did what it was supposed to do, they, it, it, they, you know, we, we wouldn't have a need, you know, but, but that's just not the way the world works. And I could spend all my time complaining about it, but I got to help you advocate for yourself. That's my job. So I see another Oh, I see a question. And I'm going to get to your question, but I, would, I just want to finish this one because I think it's on the same line. I filed a habeas in October to this day. There has been nothing but continued delays. And two weeks ago, the lawyers for the BOP told us that they would do some new assessment would take place prior to today. That assessment's taking place. It, as I said, please give it until the 10th. Um, I'm glad you filed a habeas. A habeas is, is typically a pro se motion where you're asking the judge to intervene, but the BOP is saying, hey, this is what they're doing. There's a new policy. It's going to happen. I, I, I would not be surprised if it's done by next week. I mean, this last week was Thanksgiving week and, right? I think so. I was asking, I don't know, maybe it was the week before, but I get confused. It's going to happen. Sometimes the Bureau of Prisons moves slowly. Not sometimes, all the time. It's a huge agency. Let's deal with it. Um, I don't know who PEM is, but let's take a let's give it another week. Um, and and the, and the reality is that we don't always have we well, we never have the ability to to tell a judge when to respond to a habeas. That's just a fact. A federal court federal judge he responds when he wants to respond. You can file, you can do all the work you can, but I don't I I suspect whoever PEM is. I suspect you're going to get access. You're going to get the relief that you want before the judge responds, and it'll be me. <laughs> we'll see. Um, I see Mr. 
I know that the young guy, um, uh, Richie, I think is his name. Go ahead and unmute yourself and let's, uh, let me respond to your question. Thank you. I was just at, talking to Scott, but I, I'm starting my plea deal um, at 2.30 Central. And it's, it's part of the petition has a background because I'm hoping to do RDAP. I'm going, I'm doing all the work to do RDAP, but it has a, um, a section on it about alcohol um, on the plea itself. Mm -hmm. um, does that get, do you know anything about that or how that? I, I know a lot about it <laughs> and I'm okay. glad you asked because it's very important for you right now to be thinking about that at the plea deal. Do you, did you, did the government already give you a, a, a proffer, a deal that would say, if you plead guilty, we're going to give you whatever. It's a binding plea. What, how much is that? The plea? How long? 90 months to 102 months. Okay. So that's a long time. So this is a very important subject to the cover, but it's not so important today. Today's going to be a very perfunctory hearing. If you're, if you've got a hearing before a court today, no, it's, I'm just signing it. Oh, so you're just signing it. So here's the way that process is going to go. You're going to sign the plea. Then there's going to be a change of plea hearing because you've already pleaded not guilty, right? Yes. So you're going to have another change of plea hearing before you go before a federal court. You're going to change your plea to guilty, okay, uh, in accordance with that binding plea, okay? Then there's going to be a pre-sentence investigation report. If you are, are you a member of our community? Like, are you working with the Sam and Justin? Larry. Those guys? Larry. Larry's They're going to get you ready for that before the pre-sentence investigation report. And that's going to be very important to you. But it's not important today. Today, today, just sign the plea, get the deal. And then we're going to, here's what's going to happen next. Larry and Sam are going to work with you to get you ready before your uh, pre-sentence investigation report. And they're going to get you ready to prepare before your sentencing hearing. And when that's happened, we're hopefully going to get you below that 90. When you say it's a binding, does that mean that the judge yeah. can't go lower than 90? Correct. Okay. So the 90, we're going to make sure that you get the 90, but then we're mm -hmm. going to make sure that you've got everything teed up so that you can get when you're in, when you have an administrative stuff and you have to persuade the Bureau of Prisons to let you serve the majority of that 90 at home. That's, that would be the next stage of your advocacy work. But I'm glad you're working with Larry and Sam early. That's exactly what Jason was talking about when he says, I wish I would have known this early. You're going to be very well prepared, just like Kent was and just like, um, and, and, and what's important for you to remember, Richie, is 90 months is the plea deal. If you play your cards right and you do everything possible, you are going to want to be able to go back to your judge, say three years from now, after you've completely recalibrated your life and done everything differently and ask your judge for compassionate release because you've had built this extraordinary and compelling record. And our team and our webinars kind of reveal what does that mean? Because administratively, this can happen later. If this is your binding plea is 90 months, right? We want to get you, we want you to be in a position to get out at 40 months or 30 months or 50 months, or whatever it is. We can't do that, of course, but we can show you, hey, here are all the seeds that you can sow today to hopefully put yourself in a better position later. And you can learn about it just by going to our website, but our team will be there to help you along the way, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Would you, would so, you mind explaining, this is Lawrence, uh, would you mind explaining uh, the alcohol part in your plea, are they actually saying that they're going to support you to go to an RDAP in your plea? Is, are you actually, uh, is that what, what the alcohol part in your plea is about? Hello? You got to unmute yourself, um, Richie. He's asking you a direct question if you can hear him. Can you hear him? But you're, you're muted. Un, un, unmute yourself. Let me see if I can unmute you. There we go. Good. There you go. Yeah. Respond. Um, Scott, if you can help me, but I, I, I texted Scott a picture. It's, it's just in the plea. I don't know if they're all standard. They're all the same background question. How old are you? What's your education? Have you ever, have you ever been under the care of a doctor for drugs or alcohol treatment addiction? It's just, you know, if anybody can, can, um, yeah, I can, I can respond Larry. It's is what's really going to be important 
on the plea is that you get that that area is really something that your lawyer should be should have negotiated to get you the best possible plea where this becomes very important is in the pre-sentence investigation report right and um i if you, there's a lot of stuff on our website that talks about it our team are experts on it and they can help you with that um but 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 at the plea hearing it's really not that relevant. What's relevant to the plea hearing is you is you get the lowest possible deal. And there's Understood. somebody that's got a lot of background noise, so I'm gonna there there. I believe you did, Larry. Okay, so I'm gonna continue reading down the list of comments. So there's a question actually from Lawrence. It says, "You mentioned that yesterday the BOP is recalculating sentences with those who have a sentence of less than 18 months." Did the BOP make any Yes, that 18 month thing is no longer part of the policy. So disregard anything you've heard us say in the past or some memo that is no longer part of the policy so that's irrelevant at this stage i'm going to go to the next one sam oh sam already answered that i see that um pam to everyone the issue though is even though the 18 month threshold is no longer an issue when will there be adjustments to the sentences now okay they are supposed to be recalibrating everybody's computation seat sheet now but as I said earlier, remember, it's the Bureau of Prisons. There's 120,000 people in the Bureau of Prisons. They're recalibrating every single person's sentence. Give it a couple, give it longer than a day, okay? Give it longer than a day. Don't expect them to say, boom, there's a magic pill. All 120,000 people are done and it got passed along. Give it 10 days and let's reassess it. I will be reassessing it. And I will be in federal prisons next week. I won't be doing the webinar because on two, on Wednesday, I'll be presenting in Rochester federal prison. And on Friday, I'll be presenting inside of the Oxford federal prison. But the cool thing about that is I get to work with the wardens directly and I will get the insight what's going on with this recalculation. And I will communicate that with our team and it'll go out in an email. So everybody will be in the loop of what I learned. Okay, um, I see here everyone. Clay, Clay is Clay is a great member of our team, so I don't think I have to answer anything with Clay. Um, Stephen, to uh, every, but make sure the individual effort prior to surrender goes beyond the metrics of your sentence. There are so many ways to impress us. Okay, yes, Clay, that's great guidance. Okay, let's go to Stephen. It says I also have a question about eighteen month threshold. I am out of um, halfway house. Yeah, the eighteen months is over. So it's not part of the policy. Everybody can see the policy. I published it on our website. If you, if you, it, I think it's under the advocacy section, um, but just look through our website and you can see the actual policy and read it for yourself. And you will see there's nothing in there about the 18 months, but the Bureau does have to redo the computation sheet for every person in prison. And when it does, those credits should apply. Let's, let's, let's revisit this after give me a give them at least 10 days because it is the bureau of prisons right it's not it's not microsoft it's not google okay it's the bureau of prisons okay the my, fact that you're saying 10 days is pretty impressive i mean 10 days once you've been to the bop 10 days is is great let, let me explain to you why i say that scott is because of the pressure that the director is getting okay mm. and i it, because it's a priority in the bureau some of you may know I wrote about it on our blogs. If you guys are following it on our website, um, two days before the policy came out, um, two senators, Senator Durbin and Senator Grassley, so a bipartisan group, wrote a letter to the attorney general complaining about the Bureau of Prisons being slow in rolling out the First Step Act and um, requiring the attorney general to give a response to Congress by December the 7th. Two days later, the Bureau of Prisons had its policy out. This is going to move faster because there's pressure, right? We, as, as an advocacy group, we try, I, I mean, my role is to influence um, wardens and so on. Hey, this is important, we've got to do it. But it's one thing for me to say something. It's another thing for Senator Durbin and Senator Grassley who controls the budget for the Bureau of Prisons. They're doing it. This is going to happen, it, and that's why I'm saying give it 10 days, which is lightning speed for the Bureau of Prisons. 
but there are hundreds of thousands, there's more than a hundred thousand people being influenced by this. So give it 10 days and let's, let's reassess. Um, I see from Mr. Delgado or A. Delgado, my sentencing is December the 6th. I have a two, oh, I know this is a tough time for you. You're very nervous and you've got a lot of anxiety of December the 6th. I have a two year mandatory minimum sentence. How do people like me prepare for this type of sentencing? Well, you're asking a question that is a great question, but you've got to do the work by going through prison professors and looking at all. That's like asking me, Mr. Delgado, I don't know if you're a member of our community or not. If you are, you should be getting this guidance from Sam and Justin and, 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 and Scott and so on. If you're not a member of our community, then you've got to do the work. That means you've got to go to prisonprofessors.com. You've got to watch. I mean, I've got a thousand videos on there. I've got interviews with federal judges. I've got lots of books and articles that you can read. You know, I say you can get this information for free and you can't, right? It's very expensive to deal with our team. I, I, I'm not going to, why? <laughs> because your funds that you guys pay are what allows me to go hire the former director of the Bureau of Prisons. It allows me to go into prisons and fund doing all that kind of work, right? So we're an advocacy company, but I say as somebody who did 26 years in prison, I'm committed to giving everything away whether you can pay or not. But somebody's got to do the work. And, and if you're not a member of our community, Mr. Delgado, and, and forgive me, I just don't know. There, there's hundreds and hundreds of people. I don't know them all. But everything's on our website. So it's like saying, um, you know, there are people in our community that are doctors or physicians or masters of business. And, and, and they, they've got a tremendous amount of knowledge. And so maybe they're hiring to get expertise from our community. But you could get it just by watching all the videos. You can get it by reading all the books. You can get it by going through all of the articles. So I'm going to encourage you, spend your time on the website and learn how to prepare before sentencing. Because you're asking me a question like saying, where's the best food in China? Well, there's just too many ways for me to answer that. Learn as much as you possibly can before the 6th. And if you're working with our team, I have all the confidence in the world that they're going to help you. You could reach out to Scott Laney right there. Scott, there's a guy there named Mr. Delgado. I don't know if he's, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't know who you are, Mr. Delgado. So forgive me. I, that, I'm just in another area of the company. So I don't know. But our members of our team, I have all the confidence in the world on. Okay. P-E-M to me. Mr. Santos, I'm Michael, by the way. My, Mr. Santos was my dad. He passed away when I was in prison. <laughs> so everybody, I'm just Michael. <laughs> I have to leave for a meeting. Oh, okay. If you can give me info pertaining to receiving, I will give you everything I can as soon as I get it and as I get it. But I'm going into the prison system next week to two prisons. I'm going to speak with two different wardens in two different states. One's in Wisconsin, one's in Minnesota. And I'll have more information that I will share with our team. And it will be on, well, it probably won't be on next week's webinar because I'll be in the prison. I can give the information on, on, to Justin on um, my visit after Wednesday. But I, I suspect that we're going to be seeing stuff next, this week or next week. Okay, I have a mandatory five-year minimum, so I understand. Okay, good. Somebody may have, a, whoever wrote, I have a five-year mandatory minimum. I just want to say something about that. Five-year mandatory minimum is what you're getting now, okay? I want you to be thinking about what are you going to be doing in two years or in a year and a half to go back to your judge and persuade your judge that you're a worthy candidate because of your extraordinary, extraordinary and compelling record that you've built. If you look on our website, the homepage, <laughs> Halim, you are going to see somebody that had a double life sentence, and he is now home leading a really successful career. I don't care what your sentence is today. I don't care what your mandatory minimum is. I don't care what your plea agreement says. What I want you to be thinking about, how are you going to influence your way after you no longer have a lawyer to advocate for yourself so that you can get a lower sentence? These are the seeds that you need to start preparing. And if you don't know how to do that, either talk with Scott, and Sam and Justin, or spend all your time on our website and learn. Because this is your life, just like it was my life. I, I had a 45-year sentence, and I had to deal with it. I want you to learn how to deal with it 
in a manager manner that you get through it with your dignity intact and you feel confident I can do some things today to pull levers that will allow me to get a better outcome. Okay, the, the, the Zoom user, the effaces of a white collar crime bottom line, let's face it, this is a business, hence who can afford it eventually. It is also a sales pitch. That's great. I, I, I appreciate whoever said that, whoever the Zoom user is that said, it says the effaces is on white collar crime. Bottom line is, let's face it, this is a business. Without a doubt, this is a business. And some of you have paid a lot of money to be a part of this business. No doubt. Some of you have paid nothing. I, nobody's paid anything to be on this webinar. I can tell you that. Anybody can join. And nobody's going to have to pay to get anything on prisonprofessors.com. Nothing. Okay? But you have to be willing to do the work. If you hired our team, then you have a right to expect our team to be there for you and to help you solve problems that you may not know how to solve. But you've got to be willing to do the work. I don't know who you are, Zoom user, but I'm Michael Santos, and I stand behind our team, and I'm the, la the buck stops with me, okay? I coach our team. I want to give everything away for free. I do. But if I'm going to provide you a resource like this, like that, right? If I'm going to show you a resource like this right here, right? I've paid these guys tens of thousands of dollars to come on this site and give us information that you can get for free. You can't hire them yourself, but I can as an advocacy group. And I do. And that's what resources go to do is to hire, not the judges, the judges come on because they believe in us, but you should be watching this and learning and understanding. And, 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 and you don't have to pay me a penny for it. Okay. All of that's free because some people do pay and that provides resources that we use to become great advocates for you all the way through the journey. And I would never ask anybody to do anything I didn't do. That's how we built it, to build an ecosystem. You don't have to agree with it. That's okay. But I will always be honest with you. And, and, and I will always tell our team to be honest with you. And I will always fight to get a better outcome for every person in prison, whether anybody's paid us or not. And I just hope that that's how you feel about me. I hope your lawyer is giving you that same level of commitment. Continuing down the, the chat calls. And you can see, this is totally transparent. If anybody hears anything I'm saying that they don't agree with, I encourage you, bring it up. Because I want to address it. I want everybody in our community to be happy and say, these guys are fighting for us. There has been a lot of discussion about when the FSA credits will be applied to prisoners that have 18 months or less. Says, I was released from federal prison camp. This is Brian's giving a comment. So Brian's another member of our community that will tell you what is going on, what he experienced. SWAWD. I would like to understand the difference in forfeiture and restitution and how that affects the financial responsibility. Program. My name is Jeff. Hi, Jeff. I don't know if anybody's written that, so I'm just responding to these as I go down the list. Um, Jeff. Forfeiture and restitution are two different things in that, in that um, you, you may have had money that the government seized and part of your sentence is they're going to keep that money. Restitution is something else. It is part of the sanction, okay? And that sanction stays with the person all the way through the journey. It's just like your sentence. And if you get a restitution order, the Bureau of Prisons is going to require, it's not, it doesn't require, right now it's voluntary, but I'm letting you know based on my advocacy work and the work I'm doing with wardens, I know it's going to be a policy soon. Congress is going to pass a law on it. And I'll tell you why. Um, who's that big rapper? There's a very famous rapper that's in prison right now. I forgot his name. Um, R. Kelly. R. Kelly. Yeah, R. Kelly. He had hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars in his commissary account. And the U.S. attorneys learned about that. And they, they're very upset at the Bureau of Prisons because the Bureau of Prisons, he's also got a lot of lawsuits against him from victims. And they want to take that money and give it to the victims. And so Congress has been raising that with the Bureau of Prisons. They're going to have to write a law to make the Bureau of Prisons to be able to take money from people's commissary accounts. Right now, there's something in the Bureau of Prisons called the Financial Responsibility Plan, FRP. You'll hear a lot about it. 
you'll hear us in future webinars really emphasize the importance for you to understand the FRP and have a plan to participate in FRP because it is going to influence your release date. No question about it, okay? If you want to get maximum earn time credits, maximum home confinement credit, make sure you understand FRP and you comply with it. What does it mean? It, the Bureau of Prisons is going to ask you voluntarily right now until it's a law to agree to give so much money every month based on the amount of money that comes into your account. So a, to, to be very specific, Jeff, forfeiture is if you've got assets and part of the plea is to take those assets, that's forfeiture. That has nothing to do with restitution. Your judge is going to say, I sentence you to 36 months in federal prison and a $100,000 fine. According to the law as it exists today, the government has 20 years to collect on that debt. And that 20 years does not start to toll until you finish your time in the Bureau of Prisons. So after you finish with the BOP, the government will have 20 years to collect on that debt. If you have not yet been sentenced, my recommendation to you is you work with our team or you learn on your own how to do it to try and ask your judge to give an order that says you won't have to pay that restitution until you finish with the bureau. Because if you've got it, well, if you got to do it while you're in the bureau, the bureau is going to be trying to take money out of your commissary account. And it's really not going to move the needle in your for, for people that have large restitution orders. Um, if, you're, if your restitution order is 100 bucks or 200 bucks, that's different. But if it's like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands and you can't pay it, you're way better off doing this when you come home than while you're in prison. Um, but again, we've got a specific webinar on FRP. I can't do it all right now because it's there's just too much to learn. I hope that answered your question on the difference. Forfeiture is if it's part of your plea, they're taking it. Restitution is what's going to be hanging over your head going forward. Okay, but it is very important to understand FRP. So please pay attention to our webinar and look at our resources on prison professors. Random. In my county jail, they had video calls. Does the feds offer video calls? Yes, if you're a woman. <laughs> because in the female prisons, they do. Male prisons, they don't right now. But I would look to see that expand. So that's expanding. And but it is, it's certainly not what you're used to seeing here any more than email. They have email in prison, but it's not used to what, you're, what you do. So we offer stuff on our website that kind of shows you what to expect. Female prisons, and I don't know if it's all female prisons, but many female prisons do offer video calls. Um, personal video calls or attorney video calls. So Brian, yeah, you're asking that question because you're in a male prison. They do offer it for attorneys and courts, but what he's talking about is just like phone calls in women's prisons, many women's prisons, they do have like a Zoom feature. It will expand throughout the Bureau. That's one of the things that I work on on the advocacy side, but we may be years away from that happening. Hi, Lisa, Jeff. Oh, the way it's explained to me in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for putting your comment in there. Um, Brian, some prisons have started using tablets. Yes, all prisons are going to have tablets. That's a big deal. It's something I work on right now a lot. That's why I was just in Dallas last week. Um, they're, they're in the Bureau is rolling these out right now in commissaries, but that's not the kind of tablet that those tablets only offer things like um, movies and music, and they may have chat functions on there. But this is all an evolving thing in the Bureau, and it's not what you're going to see in two years is going to be very different from what they see today. Can't. I can't. <laughs> okay, Kent. Kent is there. Should I reach out to the prison? Okay. No, you can get your you can get your copy right now, Kent, on on the on the Morgantown handbook, and you can read other handbooks. Just familiarize yourself with it. Okay. Um, the handbook is going to make you more literate on what how the Bureau of Prisons operates and the vernacular of prison because it's a whole different language. If you don't know the language, you don't know what questions to ask. So yes, I would recommend you read the Morgantown one and then go to other prisons and read those as well. And then at bring those questions to our webinars. Um, yeah, and, and you could, Scott, I don't think they're going to, 
yeah, you can call them if you want, but you could just read a lot of handbooks. They don't change that much. Okay. They, they will change with this new Paul. You're going to get more stuff on prison professors website than you will in that handbook for sure. But read, just read all I'm asking you to do. Kent is become literate. You're going into a new world. And the more you know about that world, the better off you are. Scott says they likely will share it in our current COVID protocols. Yes, that's true. Thank you. Lair Lawrence's iPhone on medical. I don't understand part one or part two of the form. Also meds are only given twice a day. Um, hi, Lawrence. Um, you don't know, we have a whole webinar on the formulary where we really explain it. I, I really ask my wife to be involved. And we have subject matter experts on that front who are former, they're not even on our subject matter page, but there's a former warden who's an expert on, on these kinds of things. If you have special medical challenges and you need to understand this, and if you're a member of our community, please reach out to our team so that we could try and address those early, particularly if you have not had your PSR yet. If you have been already gone through the system, make sure you read through our stuff on the website. And is that, are you speaking to us, Lawrence? Go ahead. No, and I did see those uh, just now as you were talking, I did see there were a couple of webinars um, associated with that. So I'll go back and look at them. I'm currently working with uh, Larry and Scott and great. uh justin etc the team great uh, great great but there's more have you been sentenced yet or are you in the PS psr stage no i haven't been sentenced yet my change of plea is january 27th okay so before you get your psr this is an area where if you're a member of our community it would make sense for us to hire a guy to speak with you a little bit before because they can tee up, help you tee up that PSR to solve some of the problems that, that could come later. So the yeah. earlier we address that, the better we are, but you're too early now. Once you get your change of plea and you hear about the pre-sentence investigation report, I want you, whoever your guy is on our community, um, at, you're going to want to speak, and I'll just show it to you. You're going to want to have somebody in our community either speak with probably not Scott, probably John okay. who can provide a little bit of guidance. He has a lot of knowledge on this and we have other members in our community that are former BOP people that will tell you things you can do. And, 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 and just, just to try and help you along the way. Okay. Because I have uh, diabetes and Graves' disease and then chronic um, neck pain from- you, you know the right person they're going to be speaking to is going to be my wife, Carol. She's going to be involved on that formulary. My wife is a registered nurse and she's kind of the chief operating officer for us. She's going to know, she'll know what to do. So once before you get to the PSR, you're going to want to say, hey, I want to talk to Carol. Okay? okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Uh-huh. Let me go to the next person. Lawrence, Lawrence on medical. Okay, Bradley. Has anyone gone to Otisville camp? I don't know. There's going to be people in our community that know things at Otisville camp. I know it's a great camp. It's got a great reputation. I'm sure we know people at Otisville. They'll help you when you get there. Scott, Brad, I guess. Has anyone needed to be transferred to camps to get an RDAP? Yeah, that happens all the time, Bradley. People get designated to a prison. And then when you get ready for RDAP, they'll send you there. It, the nice thing is it's typically a furlough transfer, um, but hopefully we get you to the place before. If you haven't been sentenced yet, make sure you communicate that with your, your teammate so that we can kind of help you with that before you're sentenced, preferably even before you do the PSR, but really it's sentencing. But again, I have a lot of information on designations on the website. And, and there's probably a webinar that we do specifically on that. Otisville's RDAP, Chris Cheryl, <laughs> is the B in the BOP is the mail open by staff or is it kept private? There is no privacy in the Bureau of Prisons anywhere, not even going to the bathroom. Okay. The Bureau of Prisons, you have to just anticipate there is no privacy ever, right? Staff members can open the door when you're going to the bathroom, the shower, it doesn't matter, right? You can try and minimize your exposure to those kinds of things, but that's prison. So we need to understand that 
certainly mail. Every piece of mail gets opened in the Bureau of Prisons. And sadly, there is a new trend. I don't think it's going to happen in minimum security camps, but it could, um, where they're not even allowing you to get the mail. Instead, they're taking images of the mail, and then you see the mail on your tablet or on some type of a device rather than holding your, your, your mail. There are so many complications on mail. We definitely have a webinar on mail. But again, this is an evolving subject for a lot of reasons. And I'll tell you one, just two or three weeks ago, I mean, this is the first time I've ever heard of this happening in the Bureau of Prisons in my whole journey. But somebody at the Tucson camp was visiting and he smuggled in a gun into a real firearm and put it to his visitor's head. He had a suicide note in his pocket that he wanted to kill his wife and his kids and himself. Fortunately, the gun didn't go off, it pulled, but he did pull the trigger. And as a result, everybody in the Tucson camp has been moved into segregated housing unit. When that happens, there's a whole parade of things that happen. There's an FBI investigation going on. And people that had nothing to do with it are, are having a harder time. But because of things like that, the Bureau as an agency, it starts changing policies. So look, this is a, that has never happened in the 35 years that I've been involved in the Bureau of Prisons. But my experience of being involved in the Bureau of Prisons is 30, of 35 years is that when things like that happen, they make changes. I don't know what those changes are going to be. But mail is one of the things that I am hearing about that they are changing because people send drugs in through the mail or whatever. So they have all kinds of policies that they change. One of the ones that they are already doing in many higher security prisons is they've got this technology that they scan every letter and then the letter goes up on a screen and you, that's how you get your mail now. I hope that doesn't happen, but do recognize no mail, nothing is private in prison. Now, if it comes from an attorney and it's appropriately marked, that is not reviewed. So what happens if it comes by mail is it's like this. I hope you guys can see me. I'm not sharing my screen, right? Is the staff will take it. They'll call you up. They'll say, okay, here's a letter from your attorney. It's properly marked. They will open it. The staff member will open the letter. He'll look inside. He'll look like this. He won't read it, but it'll go like that. He'll put it back in and he'll give it to you. That's as close to privacy as you get in the Bureau of Prisons. So always remember that. Um, Jason, Clay, Cheryl, report article on this issue. Clayton's responding. Brian, Tasha. Hi, Tasha. I had these guys early too. We're grateful that you're a member of our community, Tasha. Um, Roxy, any idea the CARES Act will be extended in March? Uh, that's a Carol question, <laughs> you know, and that's a political question. Remember that the CARES Act, the good news is, the CARES Act isn't only about prisons, right? The CARES Act is massive, and it has a lot of implications all across the country. So as long as the CARES Act is in place, it, it influences finance, it influences all kinds of things. And I would expect care, I'm going to turn to my wife now. Do you have any insight on CARES? Have you read anything on the CDC that COVID's still going and No, you have no knowledge. We really don't. That's a political decision. It's up to the president. But the, what I see going on in China, you know, that they see that it's that people aren't dying, but they still don't want people to get it, right? Right now, it's the law. We just, that that's a political question. So, um, that's all we would be able to say, Roxy. Um, let me see, Bruce. So when I report on January the 4th, they should be a computing my time based on the, definitely yes, Bruce. The new policy will be guiding you going forward. Yes, yes. Michael, are you working with Senator Asa from Georgia? I don't work with senators. I work with the Bureau of Prisons a lot. If I work with senators, it's indirectly. Is it, When I go into prisons, for example, um, 
I tell the people in prison how important they are to helping our advocacy work because we have to show that people that are, are that are that are doing self advocacy and, and preparing themselves for success upon release that's good for society and the real big heavy lift right now is making sure that we extend the whole earn time credits thing and making that available for everybody and making sure that the day you go in there you can qualify to get everybody should get 15 days a month by participating in programs. That's the big advocacy effort that I'm trying to do. And if CARES Act is in existence, to get people the home confinement as soon as they qualify. So right now it's a 25%, 50% rule. That stuff's on our website, but I don't work directly with senators. I work with the Bureau of Prisons. That's really where my area is now. And then trying to get the Bureau of Prisons to advocate with Congress. But I want you to know, I only work with the highest levels at the Bureau, meaning the wardens, the regional directors, and the people in DC. They are all, they are all supportive of these things, okay? It's, it's that it's a huge agency and there's 35,000 people that are doing things. And sometimes this hand doesn't know what this hand is doing. If, if this hand always did what Congress wants, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't have to be advocating for ourselves. I go through the Bureau of Prisons anticipating the Bureau of Prisons is going to have an, a, 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 an obstruction. And my job is to help myself get over those obstructions. So I want everybody to understand that. That's why we say learn to expect disappointment and learn to do the best that you can. When financial assets like bank accounts are frozen, can one still use cash, credit cards? How does a service, one service debt? Okay, that's a very good question. So bank accounts are frozen. Can one still use cash? Of course, if you have cash, you can use cash. Credit cards, yes. But that depends on a sanction, right, Jeff? It I don't know what your sanction is. What you want to do is, and it, this is also going to depend on what stage of the journey are you in. Because if you haven't been sentenced yet, we've got to start by defining success. Success is really about getting the lowest possible sentence first. And finance can have a role in that, okay? Finance can have a role. If you've got a big fine or a big restitution order, you want to be able to argue at sentencing that you've tried to solve that because that's going to really move the needle with your judge. Don't take my word for that. Watch, our, watch the interviews that I've done on video with two federal judges. They want to see you doing something about your san sanction. So, so this is very important um, for you to be thinking about. Um, but but, but the, I've written a lot about that. I've got whole videos on that. But, but the, the, the way that I would answer that question, if you, if you were working with me and I was you know, a, a consultant and I did that, I would be telling you, well, have you been sentenced or are you not sentenced? If you've not been sentenced, I would be suggesting that you think about a financial plan to help your judge say, this is a guy that's really doing something to change his life, and I want to reward him by giving him a lower sentence. If you've already been sentenced, then I would be thinking about, okay, what's the Bureau of Prisons going to do, and how is this going to influence my ability to get to a home confinement sooner? So it's going to depend on where you are, Jeff, in the journey. And I would encourage you to look on anything on our website about financial responsibility and how the system looks at it, because it's not important what you want. It's not important what I want. It is important what the system wants. So understand that and you'll be better off. Tasha, we have briefly talked about work restrictions on calls. Can my son ask me questions about his business after I surrender? At the beginning of my situation, I taught him some new work skills and he started a business, but he doesn't have the experience I have in more complex areas of finance. Yes, this is a great question, Tasha. While I was in prison, I ran a lot of businesses. You should definitely read Earning Freedom, Conquering a 45-Year Sentence. If you don't want to read, because it's a very big book, I don't even think I have a copy of it around here, otherwise I'd show it to you. But you could look on Audible, and you, and you can get it on Audible and listen to it while you're driving. Um, and the reason that you want to do that is you're going to hear about the ways that I ran businesses while I was in prison. So when it comes to your son, if your son has a question, could you unmute yourself? Are you still on the call, Tasha? 
Yes, okay. I'm here. So um, let's let, let's just do it a real live example. Be your son and I'm going to be you. Ask me any question. Um so he doesn't understand the more complex. I thought No, no, just speaking. ask me the question. Just, okay, so how how do I um categorize a new fixed asset with a notes payable? That's a great question, Bob. <laughs> and if I were home, <laughs> let me just tell you, this is exactly what I would do. But I can't do it now because I'm in prison and I'm not allowed to run a business and I don't want to have any misconstrues that I'm running a business from here. But so I can't tell you what to do. You have to do it yourself. But if I were home, I would probably do it this way and then this way. But you have to make your own decision. Does that make sense, Bob? Okay. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way you have to do it. Because if I say, Bob, come on, how many times I got to tell you this, dude? Do this, do this, do this. Now I'm running a business. Okay. Yeah. You've got to be in yourself in a position. So I want you to think about this, Tasha, that you're sitting across the table from a lieutenant and the lieutenant's going to play the thing. It says, wow, Tasha, it sounds like you're telling him what to do. You're going to say, no, I'm not telling him what to do. I told him I can't do it. I specifically mm -hmm. said, I can't do it. But I said, if I were home, I would do this, but you have to make your own decision. That's going to save you. Okay. okay. So just use your critical thinking skills that way. And um, we've been on this video for a while, so you could even play this little segment for Bob <laughs> or whatever okay. his name is. <laughs> Say, Bob, I want you to ask me questions this way, okay? So I'm okay. glad you're asking that because I don't, I, I don't want you to get disciplinary infractions for that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, same. Okay? Could he say like in what, what is your opinion or like, could he, should he phrase it more like that? I understand my yeah, response, I'd always but is just there say, a way what, he what, should what should it? I do? But it's more important. He could ask whatever he wants. You always okay. have to say, I'm not allowed to get to tell you how to do it. If I were home, this is what I would do. And I used to okay. do that. But if you read Earning Freedom or you listen to mm -hmm. it, you're going to hear a lot of examples of how I did it with publishing, okay. stock market and investing and all kinds of stuff. And, and I did a lot of stuff in prison, you know, so I want you to okay. have a successful journey. Um, okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. Good. So I surrender in 30 days. Should I have already received my designation? Should. Yes. Um, it may not happen. <laughs> I mean, we've known people who don't get their designation till the week before. So I don't know when you're going to get your designation. I think it's pretty likely you are going to get it. If you don't have it within, um, 15 days and you're working with somebody in our team, make sure that you ask them to get the kind of help that, that um, Jason spoke about earlier, because Larry may be able to help with that. Um, Jeff, this is a pre-sentence pre-arrangement question. There is a concern about being able to retain choose due to frozen assets. Yeah. You, if you don't have assets and you need to get a defense attorney, then you're probably going to get a uh, federal defender or a panel attorney. Don't think that that means you're going to get bad repu, bad repu, uh, what do you call that? Bad representation. I have a tremendous amount of confidence in federal defenders and on people on the panel, but I have a lot more confidence in you. <laughs> you are going to be the most important person on this, not your attorney. So the more you learn, the better off you're going to be. Um, is, is, is lessons from prison available in audio? No, it's not available in audio. Um, but I want you to know about lessons from prison. You know, the, I know that book. I'm very intimately involved in writing that book with Justin. We did it when we were in prison together. Um, there's a lot more stuff that you can get on the website that's going to be way more valuable to you. We wrote lessons from prison kind of when we were, he was just getting out of prison and, and, and we were kind of starting this and said, hey, you need to have a book. And we worked that together. But it's a lot more about Justin's story, which I'm sure is, 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 is really going to be interesting to you to have been a finance guy that went through the system. But what's way more important for you at this stage, what can you do? What can you do at every stage to influence the best outcome? Ask that question every day. Go through the website every day talk with who, if you're working with Justin, just talk with Justin. Um, he's got several hundred videos on his website where he, where he, he, he reveals the same stories that you could listen to or read. Um, there's a lot of stuff. Okay. Not no one, one, no one asset is going to give you all the answers to your questions. No one asset any more than Jeff. Are you still on the website? If you are, would you, 
unmute yourself. Let's just have a conversation. If you, are you there, Jeff? Okay, so anybody who's going through this that's asking questions, please remember that. There is no one magic pill. There's no one book. There's no one video. There's no one webinar, right? This is a lifetime journey. And we're going to help you get through that lifetime, but I can't do it in one, one day and not one book. So be prepared to go through this and recalibrate. And I'm here to tell you, you absolutely can. Um, Jeff, there's a pre-sentence. Okay. Is lessons from prison? No. Bruce, visitation. Should my family wait before trying to visit? Like not for the first few weeks. If visiting is available, I can tell you that visiting helped me. I lived for visiting in prison. I visited, my wife moved 22 times to come visit me so that we could visit every single time. I want you to have visits, but I, I, I just don't know your family resources and your location. But if you can visit, I would definitely visit. I think it's going to be very helpful to you and very helpful to your family. But make sure you've done all the process before that so they're on your visiting list and everything like that. There's a webinar that we do on visiting. Bruce, when do you surrender? Bruce, are uh, you there? January 4th. So that's about a month. Have you watched our all of our webinars before about visiting and stuff? So you know about visiting? Yeah. So you know about the visiting yeah. list and things of that sort? Okay, good. Um, do all we the just, that you I'm sorry, no, we were just wondering, you know, because we heard there, we heard some of the stories that uh Family members don't have to be on the list and fill that paperwork out because they're in the PSR, but they still were denied that kind of thing. I just, I need to have her drive down there and then not be able to come in. And okay, um, I I would tell you that there is a definitely a policy that she is in your PSR, and she is if she's in your PSR, she doesn't have to be on your visiting list. That's enough but you're still dealing with the Bureau of Prisons. And sometimes you'll meet an officer. And I could tell you the strategy. My wife was able to successfully get in there several times, but it's different. How long is your sentence, Bruce? Um, I'm kind of ashamed to even say don't, it. Six, don't be six ashamed. Months. Six months. No, that's hard. I, I admire that. I mean, I, I empathize with you and your family. Six months is six months that you should be home. For you to get a sentence of six months, my job, part of my job is trying to make it. Anybody's got six months, they should be home anyway. It doesn't make any sense. It's a waste of your life, your taxpayer's life, right? I get all of that. But if it's six months, I want you to choose which battles to fight, okay? I had a long sentence. I could fight a lot of battles, and I knew how to fight those battles. You have six months. We want you to be in a position that you're advocating to get out in two, right? When you have 25% of your time in or three, right? Or getting most home. That's a way better battle to fight. So make sure that your family's on the visiting list because although you have a right to do it, you know, we've got to choose which, sometimes we lose some battles to win the war. And I want you to get out of the soonest possible time and get the highest level of liberty and not piss people off. You know, so, so, so look, um, everybody, I think that's the last question. If anybody wants a question, just unmute yourself. I'm going to do this again tomorrow. I'm going to go over the same things. I'm going to record this. It'll be on iTunes. It'll be on YouTube, but I just want you to know, I care about all of you and I hope that you find value in our stuff. I, I really trust in our team and I hope you leverage our team. And I hope that you always see us as an asset and a resource for you. And I want to thank you for being a member of our community. It's 1037. I don't hear anybody saying anything. So I'm going to end the webinar and I wish you guys a great weekend. Thank you.